The Peter Schiff Show. Today's special live episode of the Peter Schiff Podcast is sponsored by Bambi. Bambi helps small business owners with their most complex HR issues and employment nuances across 50 states. Go to Bambi.com right now and type in Peter Schiff under podcast when you sign up. It'll really help the show. Today's podcast is also sponsored by Ladder. Ladder makes it fast and easy to get affordable term life insurance without leaving home. So go to ladderlife.com slash gold today to see if you're instantly approved. All right, everybody. Welcome to the live episode of uh, the Peter Schiff Show podcast. I decided to use this format today one, I wanted to try out the new home studio that I finally constructed. I don't have all of my equipment in here that I'm ultimately going to have, but I was able to move some of the equipment that I had in my office over to uh, the podcast. And I want to get back to doing more uh, live uh, podcasts and doing more content with video, but also... I have been speaking on my podcast over the last week or so about some action in the markets that I was observing, particularly in the precious metals markets, in the gold market, in the silver market, that to me were indicative that we might have finally reached an inflection point. Because a lot of my listeners are asking me questions, you know, when is the gold market going to bottom? When is the silver market going to bottom? And, you know... You never know, because gold and silver prices shouldn't have even been going down. They should have been going up a lot over the past year. So the fact that they went down surprised a lot of people. And so a lot of people were curious as to, you know, what do we need to see? What's going to make the uh, gold market turn? And what I've been telling people is that the reason that you've seen this weakness in gold and silver, and it's the same reason that we've seen strength in the U.S. dollar. Now, not strength uh, in the terms of that it buys more, because it doesn't. The dollar buys a lot less here at home. If you want to go to the grocery store, uh, the gas station, or wherever you're going to go with your dollars, your dollars are going to buy less. So from that perspective, they haven't been strengthening. But from a foreign exchange perspective, relative to the euro, relative to the British pound, relative to the yen, the dollars gained a lot. And that has been a big headwind for gold and silver. But the reason for that dollar strength has always been the Fed's commitment to fighting inflation and doing whatever it takes, and investors' belief in the Fed's sincerity, in its commitment, in its resolve to actually do what it was saying it was going to do. But I've been saying all along that the Fed can't do what it says it's going to do. The Fed has a long history of lying uh, to the public and to investors. Look, remember when uh, Ben Bernanke told everybody not to worry about the subprime market, it was contained. Do you think he actually believed that? I mean, there was so much evidence that the market was blowing up and that it wasn't contained. It seems to me that the Fed was just saying what it needed to say to try to assuage any fears that might be developing in the market. And remember, when Ben Bernanke went to Capitol Hill in 2009 and told Congress that the Federal Reserve wasn't monetizing the debt, that they were just buying the debt temporarily and it was all going to get sold, that was another lie. None of that debt has been sold. They just bought more debt. We have almost a $9 trillion balance sheet. And, you know, for years and years and years, the Fed kept creating inflation, QE1, QE2, QE3, Operation Twist was thrown in. And then we went to QE4, all the while saying there's no inflation. In fact, there's not enough inflation. Inflation is not even 2%. We need more. We need to keep on printing money. Printing money is inflation. QE was inflation. The problem was the effects of inflation were just postponed until last year. That's when we really started to feel the sting of the inflation that the Federal Reserve spent a decade creating. Of course, Americans felt the sting a lot earlier than that. It's just that it didn't show up in the CPI because the way the CPI has been rigged 
you need to have five or six percent inflation before it's two percent. So by the time we got seven, eight, nine percent inflation, it was much higher than that. It's probably 15 to 20 percent, but it's now so bad that they can't hide it anymore. And so they have to acknowledge it. And now inflation has become the problem. Before, inflation was the solution to the problem. That's how the government got us out of the financial crisis. They created inflation. That's how they tried to get us out of the COVID manufacturing crisis. They created inflation. All of this was to delay the pain. Well, we traded the pain of a financial crisis or of a depression for the pain of inflation, except the pain didn't seem that bad until last year. But anybody who thinks that the inflation that we're experiencing now is merely a consequence of the reckless monetary and fiscal policy following COVID still has no idea what's going on. We are paying the price for a decade, maybe two decades. It really started in earnest in 2001, 2002 in the aftermath of the bursting of the dot-com bubble. So we've got 20 years of reckless monetary policy where we just created massive inflation and we built an economy on inflation and on cheap money and artificially low interest rates. The Fed cannot reverse that. It's impossible for the Fed to actually fight inflation, but they can't admit that, so they had a bluff. And recently, with the inflation numbers getting worse and worse, they had to actually start delivering on those commitments. They actually had to start raising interest rates significantly and pretend that they were going to keep on doing it. Well, that really put a, a, you know, a gashing hole in this bubble. And the markets, of course, went into a bear market. But where we started to see the big cracks was last week, I pointed this out, when the Bank of England became the first major central bank to have to capitulate and pivot and go back to quantitative easing after promising quantitative tightening to prevent a financial crisis in the UK that had already started blowing up in pension funds, but it would have dominoed once those pension funds were forced to liquidate their gilts and had their margin calls, it would have been a domino effect. There would have been a financial crisis in the UK had they not given up the inflation fight. And they've probably given it up for good because if they restart it, well, they're just gonna be right back into the mess that they were in. And now over this weekend, you started to really see the investment community looking at some of the banks. Credit Suisse was the one a lot of people were talking about over in Switzerland. But these banks have been levered up on cheap money. They are going to be the primary losers in a financial crisis, just like they were in 2008, because they are the creditors. They were gorging on all this cheap money. They were extending all this bad credit. And when interest rates are near zero, these bad loans uh, can survive. But as the Fed is raising interest rates, a lot of these loans were going to go into default. There were going to be major bankruptcies and foreclosures, and we were going to have a worse financial crisis than 2008. 2008 was all about too much debt and the inability to pay. Well, we've got a lot more debt now, and we're even less able to pay. The only thing that kept it going was the artificially low interest rates. And in fact, even Janet Yellen herself, who was a lousy Fed chairman, and she's an even worse uh, a Secretary of the Treasury. But about a year ago, Janet Yellen was asked a question about the size of the debt and the big increase in the national debt because of COVID. And Janet Yellen said, well, don't worry about the national debt. Doesn't matter. Look how low interest rates are. Just focus on the servicing costs of the debt. Doesn't matter how much debt we have. Look, it's hardly costing us anything to pay the interest. Well, <laughs> look at it now. Interest rates, short-term rates have gone from basically nothing to 4%, and they're headed from 4% to 8%. The cost of financing the national debt has already increased by a factor of 16. If you figure from a 25 basis points to 400 basis points, that's a 16-fold increase. So if the debt wasn't a problem because it was so cheap to finance it, well, it's a huge problem now when the cost is 16 times higher. And as all this debt starts to mature, it has to roll over at these higher prices. Look, we are very close to another financial crisis. And I think what happened in the UK, and now all of a sudden, uh, looking at what's happening in Credit Suisse and other banks, 
people are starting to actually question the insanity of the narrative that they all believed in, that the Fed could actually raise interest rates to 4 or 5%, and that all hell wasn't going to break loose. I mean, remember, what happened in 2018? The Fed got to 2.5%, and everything started to collapse. We had the biggest drop in the stock market in the fourth quarter since, I think, what, the Great Depression, the worst December since the Great Depression. And the Fed had a call off quantitative easing back then. And the balance sheet was only $4 trillion. It's now closer to $9 trillion. Think about all the debt that we've taken on since 2018. If the Fed really couldn't get interest rates above 2.5% back then, it's already got them above that now. And so we really would be imploding. And, and so what I think is going on is the markets are finally just questioning this. They still haven't really figured it out. They still haven't figured out the rock and the hard place that the Fed and the country are between. Because the Fed is going to have to pivot, but inflation is going to run out of control. See, they've got to make a choice. Do they want inflation or do they want economic implosion? Now, ultimately, if they choose inflation, we're going to have an implosion anyway because we're going to have hyperinflation. It just may happen a year later. And, well, that's good enough for the politicians. All they care about is that it doesn't happen now. Because to fight inflation, and there's only one way they're going to fight inflation successfully, which is why they can't do it. They've got to raise interest rates above the rate of inflation. And inflation is what, 8%? Even if it's 6%, they got to get short-term interest rates up to 7%. They're, they're barely at 4%. they got a long way to go. And they've got to have massive cuts to government spending. They're not even considering that. Because right now, the way the government pays for spending is with inflation. Inflation is the stealth tax by which the government pays for everything. In fact, going all the way back to the TARP bailouts, Obamacare, the PPP, how did we get all this government? We didn't get it for free. We paid for it with inflation. They created money to pay for all this stuff. Now, if the government wants to get rid of inflation, they have to get rid of that money. And so they have to run budget surpluses. The Federal Reserve has to be able to withdraw all the liquidity that it's supplied. So we have to have big cuts to government spending. Right now, the government's got to cut Social Security, Medicare, Obamacare, national defense. We have to shrink the amount of money the government is spending. The government has to spend less money next year than it spent last year. In real, real terms, actual cuts, not reductions in the rate of increases, but actual cuts. That's not happening. So the government's got to choose. Do we want to have a financial crisis and cut government spending and allow bankruptcies and defaults and all these losses? Or do we want to have inflation? And that's what they're going to pick. Sure, if they thought they can get rid of inflation without a problem, yes. The public doesn't like inflation, so the politicians wanted to talk tough about inflation. But what they're going to like even less than inflation is when they lose everything they've got, when they have a complete economic implosion, when their savings and investment accounts get wiped out and they lose their jobs, they're not going to like that. Now, of course, that's going to happen eventually anyway. There's no free lunch here. If the government chooses inflation, then inflation is going to wipe everybody out. So everybody's going to get wiped out through de deflation when this whole thing collapses and a crisis, or they're going to get wiped out through inflation. But the reason the Fed is going to pick inflation is because that happens later. And of course, as we've seen, they can come up with a scapegoat to blame inflation on somebody else. They never accept responsibility for the inflation they create. So if the Fed keeps hiking rates and everything implodes, well, hey, we did that to ourselves. They so can bl blame the Fed. Blame, blame the Fed. But if prices just run out of control, well, we could blame OPEC. After all, they just cut production for oil. We could blame Putin. Uh, we can blame greedy corporations. We can blame capitalism, speculators. I mean, maybe they'll even try to blame me. Who knows? But they're never going to accept any responsibility for what they did. But what I started talking about when we saw this Lehman-type moment, and remember, you know, I'm familiar with these Lehman moments because I remember when I was short the subprime market and the things that finally happened to get me to realize that, okay, I'm, we're about to get paid because I knew what to look out for, because I was looking for these signs. That's why I said on my podcast, the idea that nobody rings a bell, it's not true. They rang the bell. They, B Big Ben went off. 
Not pe people didn't hear it. People still don't understand the disaster that the Federal Reserve has created with this policy. You know, I was very much against QE from the beginning, and people are about to find out why. The Paul Krugmans of the world and all the people on mainstream investment firms who were blindsided by the 2008 financial crisis, who laughed at me on national television when I was warning about that crisis, these are the same people who are oblivious again because they think the Fed solved the problem they didn't understand. I understood the problem. That's why I knew the crisis was coming. And I also knew that the Fed made the problem they created worse. I just didn't know how long it would take before we experience the consequences. Well, now we're here, right? We've, we've met the can that we kicked down the road and there's no place left to kick it. But people have no idea how bad this is going to be because we've had over a decade of unprecedented monetary madness and an unprecedented level of malinvestments, misallocation of resources. All these mistakes have been made that have to be corrected. And the fact that we didn't correct them a decade ago means they got much bigger, but it doesn't mean that we could, you know, avoid the day of reckoning forever. Uh, we've got a date with destiny and, you know, it's, it's soon. And what I started to observe was the divergence in the markets, looking at what happened in the precious metals market, looking at the big outperformance in silver. And today we had almost 9% move up in silver in one day. I mentioned the outperformance last week, last month in silver over gold. To me, looking like, okay, this is indicative of a turning point that you now see silver, which had been leading gold down, now leading gold up. And in a bull market in precious metals, silver outperforms gold. And the fact that it's outperforming now is a sign that we may be in a bull market. In fact, silver is now up 18% since its low last month. So that's almost a bull market. What is in a bull market by that 20% definition is gold and silver mining stocks. The GDXJ made a two and a half year low a week ago today. A week later, it's 20% higher. In one week, uh, we moved up 20% from that low. And I saw this action, I've been commenting on it the last couple of podcasts, also the topping action in the US dollar. We had that one spectacular day where we had outside reversal days in the dollar, in the gold market, in the gold and silver mining stocks, and in the bonds. And I thought the outside day in the bonds was pivotal in that it would put in a short-term top. And so far, it looks like it has. I just don't think it's going to be a long-term top. I think that's just you know, created a bear market rally in bonds. But for the dollar, I think it probably is a top. And now we're in a new bear market in the dollar and a new bull market in gold and silver and gold and silver mining stocks. So I think this is the turning point. Has the Fed officially capitulated yet? No. Have they pivoted? No. But I think the markets are starting to sense that this is imminent. And I think a lot of people said, hey, I, I don't want to buy any gold. I don't want to you know, buy these gold mining stocks until after the Fed pivots. And I've always said it'll be too late. I mean, it won't be too late but it won't be nearly as opportune as buying before the pivot because you got to take a little bit of a risk, right? No guts, no glory. The market is going to start to price in the pivot before the pivot happens. So if you wait for the official pivot, you could miss the big, a huge move off the lows. Gold stocks could double or triple before we finally get the pivot. Now, I don't think it's going to be a buy the rumor, sell the fact where the people who bought when they finally get a pivot, well, then that's the top. No, I think that's just going to send the market into, a, into another leg up because people have no idea what this pivot means because inflation is going to get worse and worse and worse during this recession. And you have a lot of people who think that recession cures inflation, that if people lose their jobs, well, that, that, that helps uh, fight inflation. In fact, people are actually saying that the goal of the Fed is to put people out of work to reduce inflation. That is nonsense. People working doesn't cause inflation. Economic prosperity doesn't cause inflation. You don't have to make the country poorer to get rid of inflation. You have to make the government smaller. The government is the source of inflation. And if anything, a vibrant economy with lots of people working helps uh, fight off inflation or at least minimize its impact because we produce more stuff. 
We need more people working. We need more supply. That keeps prices down. And so if the government just forces a recession and forces people out of work, that's going to make it worse. We're going to keep printing money. In fact, what happens in a recession? The government spends more money. The deficits go up. More bailout money, more unemployment. You know, so a recession and high unemployment is actually going to make a bad inflation problem worse. And the markets just don't ex understand that. That's why the 30-year bond is still yielding you know, 3.6%, 3.7%. People don't realize that inflation is more likely to be 10 or 15% or 20% for the next 30 years. The people who are buying these U.S. Treasuries are going to get wiped out. They're not going to get even close to compensated for their loss with a 3.7% yield. You see, there's only two things that could possibly happen to holders of U.S. Treasuries. The government defaults and doesn't pay you, or the government wipes you out with inflation. And so the debt is repudiated through inflation. Those are the only two uh, options. Option A is not very likely because the government doesn't have the integrity for an honest default. So they're going to go with option B. They're going to repudiate their obligations through inflation. And the, when the markets figure this out, the, 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 the bonds are going to get killed. So before I go and grab your questions, which is the other point of doing this, because I'm getting a lot of emails and people are asking me a lot of questions. Look, is it possible that this is a head fake? Could the Fed come out tomorrow and throw cold water on the idea that they're thinking about not hiking or that the next hike is the last hike? They, yeah, they could. They could try that. They could say, no, we don't care if we have a Lehman Brothers bankrupt. We don't care how many banks go under. We don't care if we go to depression. As long as inflation is still above 2%, we're going to keep on fighting it. Yeah, they, they could do that. You know. Now, will they do it when push comes to shove? No, they, of course they won't do it. But you know, they want to keep on talking about it, right? I mean, they want to keep talking about you know, uh, the house they have in the Hamptons and name their ponies and while they're driving there. You know, if you don't get the Seinfeld reference, yeah, they, 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 they can take it to its extreme and, and just pretend that, you know, they're, they're, they're going and they got that house. But I don't think so. I think once the markets really start to lead the Fed in a particular direction, I think that's where the Fed is going to go. I mean, I think the Fed likes to follow the markets. The elections are coming up. The midterms are coming up in November. Uh, we're getting close to November. So they don't want the market imploding. I, I, I don't think the Fed is going to try to walk this back. I think the Fed might be happy uh, that this is happening. In fact, I pointed out on my podcast, several FOMC members started to backtrack. They started saying, maybe we've gone a little bit too fast, a little bit too far. Of course, they haven't gone far enough. They were too slow. That's the problem. And remember, the problem isn't the rate hikes. That's not the problem. The problem is all the rate cuts in the past, and not just since COVID, all the way back to 2002. The Fed has maintained this policy of artificially low interest rates for 20 years. That is the problem. Raising interest rates now just exposes the problem. And now that the problem is being exposed, people want to shove it back under the rug. Well, it's not going to work. So my, my point of this is forget about it. Even if the markets go against us again, who cares? Right? you you got to understand the big picture here and where we're headed. And as far as I'm concerned, people should be all in on this trade, on this anti-dollar, despite this head fake rally. You're betting on inflation. You're betting against the Federal Reserve. You know, they always say, don't fight the Fed. Well, I'm not actually fighting the Fed. I am betting that the Federal Reserve continues to make mistakes in the future the way it's made them in the past, and that it will continue to take the expedient way out and do whatever it can to postpone a crisis. And, and therefore, it is going to you know, do what it did after COVID. It's going to do what it did after the 2008 financial crisis, even though this one is, this one is much worse. So you just got to go all in on this trade and get into real inflation hedges, get into these foreign stocks, get into the mining stocks, get into precious metals, get out of the dollar, out of U.S. bonds, and tune out a lot of these, this noise. And don't wait until you get an engraved invitation for the Fed. You can't be one of those guys, well, I'm going to sit back and I'm going to wait until the Fed tells me exactly that I can't lose. Yes, I'm going to wait for the Fed to cut rates and launch QE5, and then, then I'm going to sell my dollars. Then I'm going to buy some gold. Yeah, you and everybody else. See, the thing is, you've got to act before the crowd. 
You've got to have enough sense to anticipate what other people are going to do in the future, and then you do it now. That's how you make money. Anyway, let me go and take some questions here. Oh, I got to stop for a break. For, for, I forgot about the sponsors. Let's stop for a break for the sponsor of the show. When you're running a small business, all sorts of problems could come up with your employees. Like one of your employees claims that they were sexually harassed and you're not sure if you have the right documented policy. You better talk to Bambi. With Bambi, you get access to your own dedicated HR manager starting at just $99 per month. They're available by phone, email, and real-time chat. So onboarding and terminations run smoothly. And your business stays compliant with changing HR regulations. And with Bambi's HR Autopilot, you'll automate important HR practices like setting policies, training, and feedback. You'll get a U.S.-based HR manager who's actually been assigned to you. So you'll get HR expertise with a personal touch from your own HR expert who knows you and your business. HR managers can easily cost 80 grand a year. But Bambi starts for as little as 99 bucks a month. So schedule your free conversation today to see how much Bambi can take off your plate. Go to Bambi.com right now and type in Peter Schiff under podcast when you sign up. And it'll really help the show. That's Bambi spelled BAM to the B-E-E dot com. That's Bambi.com. And don't forget to type in Peter Schiff. All right, everybody, we're back, and I am watching the price of gold now live moving further above the 1700 level. We're at 1702.30, and silver is inching up as well at $20.76. And if this really is the beginning of the turn, we're going to see some much bigger up days in gold and silver than what we just saw, because a $40 move is, is really nothing. Uh, compared to where we're going. Because if people got this now, if they're starting to figure it out, gold is going way up. When they actually figure it out, it's going much higher. Now, later tonight, I'm doing an interview on CNBC Asia. It's been a long time since I've been on any of these CNBCs. Uh, I doubt I'm going to ever be on CNBC USA. In fact, I, I don't want to be on that network. But the Asia ones are, you know, they're a little bit different. So I'm going to do that one. But I'm doing a bull to bear debate uh, about gold. And the, the host uh, sent me a question. Well, how high is the price of gold going to go in the next year? I said, I don't know. Gold can go up $200 an ounce. It can go up $2,000 an ounce. It can go up a lot more than that. I don't know for sure. I just know there is massive upside in the price of gold because gold is priced for the Fed winning the inflation fight. When gold has to be repriced for the Fed losing, the actual price of gold is many multiples of its current value because that has major implication when it's inflation forever. We are living in an environment where we will have double-digit inflation every year in perpetuity for as far as the eye can see, unless it turns into hyperinflation, which will be even worse. So, all right, here's the first question. Thoughts on gold vaulting services like Kinesis? It can be used to spend vaulted gold via debit card and get physical. I'm not a, I'm not a sponsor, by the way. Yeah, I know quite a bit about Kinesis. I have been researching a lot of these companies because, you know, my bank blew up and I'm, I'm not really talking about that yet because I'm in the middle of litigation still on that. And so the lawyers say, hey, don't really talk about everything. And so a lot of people are probably curious what's going on there. And I believe me, I got a massive story to tell uh, on what happened there. Uh, but right now I'm kind of, you know, keeping it, you know, on the down low. Uh, while a lot of this legal stuff, and there's probably going to be more lawsuits that I'm going to file. So who knows? I, I could be in litigation for years uh, with other lawsuits. Not not me getting sued, me suing, right? Because all the bad stuff was done to me. I didn't do anything bad, but I had a lot of bad stuff done to me uh, by by a lot of people. But so I've been looking at a lot of companies, to be honest, that are doing. In fact, from what I can tell. I think they have, so far, the most robust platform I've looked at uh, relative to some of the other people I'm talking to. They've kind of got a head start on where they are. But the whole idea behind what Kinesis is doing and what I was trying to do and what several other companies were doing is tokenizing gold. I mean, all these guys that are in Bitcoin, right? they're going to get wiped out. By the way, Bitcoin barely went up today. It's still 19500 We are going to implode. But 
The, the thing that Bitcoin does well is it takes gold's monetary properties and improves them, but it doesn't work because it doesn't have the most important property of all, and that is gold's intrinsic value as a metal. But what uh, Kinesis does is they hold your gold, but then it's tokenized. And so you can have, you know, own an ounce of gold, which is worth $1,600, but it's broken down into digital, you know, coins like Bitcoin, except now you can spend a gram of gold or a tenth of a gram or a hundredth of a gram. So it takes gold and makes it so much more liquid, so much better as a medium of exchange, so much better as a, as a unit of account. I've been saying this even before anybody knew about Bitcoin. I wrote about this in my book, in uh, The Real Crash. I wrote about how eventually the, the private sector was going to re-monetize gold, gold was going to sit in vaults, and we were going to transact in um, tokens that were backed by that gold. And so if you have a, a digital currency backed by real money, it can circulate around the world faster than Bitcoin, cheaper than Bitcoin, but it's actually viable as, as a medium of exchange, as a unit of account, and a store of value, three things that Bitcoin can never do. Now, the reason that these cryptocurrencies became so popular is because people thought they could get rich. And they made up this cockable story about how they can function as money. They can't. But if you have a digital token backed by gold, it will work beautifully. It'll work better than any prior gold standard because all we had in the past was paper. So a bank can hold your gold and then you can get a banknote, right? But that was, you know, you had to physically hand somebody that banknote. But with the blockchain, with the internet, I can store gold and then get a digital currency instead of a paper currency. And now I have all the benefits of Bitcoin. The only thing you don't have, they'll say as well, you have to trust a third party. Big deal. What's wrong with trusting third parties? That's what capitalism is all about. Trust, reputation, branding. I mean, all these Bitcoin guys that say, well, you know, I wouldn't trust a third party. Do they have auto insurance? That's a third party. You trust a third party to, you know, when you put in your claim, it's a third party that's going to pay you. All insurance is based on third parties. Without third parties, there'd be no insurance industry. So this is all nonsense that you can't have a third party. Yes, you can. That's what the free market's about. And competition, third parties are going to compete. Look, Brinks stores gold for a lot of people. It's a third party. They've never lost an ounce. People have been storing gold with Brinks for 150 years, maybe more. During that time, they've never lost anybody's gold. That's a pretty damn good reputation that they don't want to lose. You know, even if somebody lost their gold, Brinks would make good on it because they don't want to spoil uh, that image because it has a lot of value in the marketplace. So, yeah, I mean, I like Kinesis uh, and there's other platforms that are out there. And I'm going to be I'm going to be announcing something uh, that I'm going to be doing with somebody, whether it's Kinesis or somebody else. Um, the uh, the guys that bought my bank, you know, they have a product. Uh, that, that they didn't buy the bank. They bought the, um, the, uh, the assets, unfortunately, out of receivership. But they've got something called G-Coin, you know, uh, and, and, and that's a, a token backed by gold. And there's a bunch of them out there. Believe me, I've been doing my research. This is where we're headed in crypto. Once everybody gets wiped out in all the nonsense where they were speculating, now they're going to go to what it was really all about, an alternative monetary system to the fiat crap that the central banks are putting out and that is gold. And with the internet, with blockchain, we can take gold to the 21st century. You know what? You know what's gold 2.0? Gold. That's gold 2.0. Not Bitcoin. Gold and the blockchain makes gold 2.0. Bitcoin is just tulip mania 2.0. Anyway, let me get back to uh, my questions. This. Oh, the first question uh, I didn't, was from. Oh, there's no name. Second question is from Carl Afable. Hey, Peter, I've been reading for a new technical analysis that says that the Dow Jones bubble has popped and the top is in. Look, I've been saying that on my podcast, and I think there's a good chance that we have a top for a decade. This is the big top, like the top in 2000, 2001, like the top in 1966, you know, before that big bear market. I, and I think by the time we make a new high in the Dow, uh, it will only be because of inflation. In real terms, 
I probably won't live to see the Dow make a new high. Certainly the NASDAQ. I mean, I don't, I don't think I'll live to see the NASDAQ make a new high adjusted for inflation. I'll, I'll, pro I'll probably see it make a new high in nominal terms. But then, you know, everything goes up. If you have hyperinflation, I mean, look how high the Zimbabwe stock market went up in Zimbabwe dollars. But who cares about Zimbabwe dollars? And pretty soon, people might be saying, who cares about U.S. dollars? It's pretty obvious that this is going to happen. The world is hemorrhaging right now from the dollar standard. The fact that the dollar has been so strong against the pound, against the euro, against the yen, that is exacerbating their problems. We are exporting our inflation to the rest of the world, and now they're having to deal with it. The problem is we just print money. We have these massive trade deficits. We're importing all this stuff. We're sucking up the goods. You know who gets this? Vladimir Putin. Listen to some of his speeches. He understands this parasitic relationship that we have with the world where we just print money and we buy stuff. We don't have to make the stuff. The rest of the world makes the stuff. We just create the inflation to pay for it. We are spreading misery all around the world and we are living off the fruits of the rest of the world. And the world is like, no, we don't want to do this anymore. There's going to be a revolution uh, against this system because the winner is the United States. The loser is everybody else. Now, you know, as an American, yeah, this was a good deal for us. But I know that it's not going to go on forever because the rest of the world is not going to stand for it. And we've really pushed them in that direction recently by weaponizing the dollar. You know, the stuff that we're done recently, uh, you know, with sanctions uh, on Russia. This is just accelerating that process. Next question from Leonard. Um, oh, by the way, these are, so this is a 25 pound question. The first one on Kinesis, the guy paid $100 for that one. So thanks for that. Uh, but so, and the reason we charge is because otherwise I have way too many questions. So this is the free market. If your question is important, you'll pay for it. If it's not important, you'll listen to somebody else's question. Okay. So from Leonard, how do you know for sure that positive real rates are needed? Why would 5% put downward flesh on inflation? So this is simple. The reason you have inflation, right, governments create money, and you have spending, you have too much demand. Well, and you don't have enough savings. How do you change that? Well, if interest rates are positive, if I can earn a real rate of return, I'll save my money instead of spending it. And that's going to take away demand in the present but it's going to increase supply in the future. Why? Because if I don't spend money, if I save that money, that money is now available for capital investment. So businesses can take my savings and use it to build a factory to make more stuff. So the Federal Reserve has to discourage people from borrowing and encourage them to save. That's why we need high real interest rates. But let's say inflation is 8% and the Federal Reserve raises interest rates to 3%, still negative 5%, am I going to be incentivized to save money? I mean, yes, losing 5% is not as bad as losing 8%, but who the hell wants to lose 5%? If I know I'm going to lose 5% on my savings, I ain't going to save. I'm still going to spend. And so if the government is not cutting back on my spending, I'm still spending everything and saving nothing, they're not going to bend that inflation curve. You've got to encourage savings. Where is savings right now? It's the lowest it's been since the 2008 financial crisis. Americans are spending everything. And in fact, what does the government want to do? Gas prices are up. Oh, we need to give people more money so they can buy those, so they can pay higher prices. No, people have to buy less gas. That's what they need to do. We can't just give them more money to keep buying it. Then the price will keep going up. So the government is not allowing the free market to do what needs to be done. You know, we're a lot poorer because the government created all this inflation. We've got an enormous government that we've got to pay for. And how do we pay for all this government? Again, we don't get it for free. We're going to pay for it with a lower standard of living. Either we're going to have less money because the government takes our money, or we're going to have inflation because the government takes our purchasing power. That's it. There is no free lunch. Okay, next question. Um... Oh, is there a, if there's a problem with our internet, yeah. So right now we're using Starlink, which I've got. So maybe there's a problem with that. 
I have another internet connection that was supposed to be working today, but you know, I'm in Puerto Rico, so nothing actually happens when you think it's going to happen. Everything takes forever. Nobody shows up on time. So whatever you think is going to happen, it doesn't happen. It takes a long, long time to get stuff done here. But I do have another internet connection that will be better than this one when the people who are supposed to install it finally get around to doing it. Um, next question. This is from Chris Con Chris Conman. I don't know if that's his real name. Do you agree that all central banks should be dissolved, including the Fed? Yeah, I believe that the world would be better off without any central banks. Every country would be better off. The people would be better off. Governments like central banks because central banks help governments get bigger and manipulate economies. You don't want that. You want a free market. In a free market, you want the government to be as small as possible, and you want no artificial manipulation. You want free market forces in charge. That's how you have an optimal allocation of resources. That's how you have the highest collective standard of living is in a free market. And central banks are an enemy of that. We don't need central banks. In fact, we need them now less than ever before. As I said, we can create our own monetary system based on gold, using blockchain, using the internet. Central banks have never been more irrelevant and useless than they are right now. We can create a medium exchange, unit of account, store of value in the private sector. Right? Everything you get from the private sector is better. It's, it's, it's more efficient. It's lower cost. The same thing with a monetary system. We don't need a government to create a monetary system. The free market can do it, and then the government can tax us. So if we're using gold as money, and then the government wants money to, to spend programs, they can tax us and take our gold and then spend it. But we don't want to empower governments to just create money out of thin air, because that, that lets them play Santa Claus. People think they get something for nothing. They don't. And if governments have to tax the people to pay for the things that the people want, all of a sudden the people won't want nearly as much stuff. As long as they think it's free, they want as much as they can get. The minute they realize they have to pay for it, they don't want it anymore. So no, we don't need any central banks. We can handle money on our own. Um, did John, did, I, don't know, I can't pronounce this name. What are your thoughts on taking out a mortgage to buy the GDXJ? Well, look, I mean, taking out a loan. Look, I have been discouraging people from leverage because of the possibility of margin calls and being liquidated. In fact, I think one of the reasons that we might have had such a big sell-off in the gold and silver stocks was because of how much leverage there was. People took on debt. And, and so it's a very dangerous thing. So I have just not encouraged people to do that. I think there's enough leverage in this trade. I think the people that get into gold stocks are going to make so much money. Can't, can't guarantee that, but this is what I believe. I mean, I think some of these stocks can go up 50 times, 100 times. So with that kind of upside, you don't need leverage. Don't get greedy. Don't be a pig, right? Just invest what you have, and you'll do fine, I think. You don't have to try to risk leverage and then potentially get you know, you know, out of the game. You know, and, and then you, you don't make anything because you got, you got a margin call. You couldn't meet it. You had to sell your stocks at a ridiculously low price. So just, just invest what you have, and I think the returns will be good enough. You know, gold mining stocks in and of themselves are a leverage bet on gold. Next one, Paul Sung. Why does it seem like 2008 is so uniquely bad? People all over political spectrum talk about how this is remnant of the global financial crisis. Free financial crisis didn't seem to have this carryover effect. Well, the reason is because of the amount of leverage that we have. Again, every time we get into a problem, the Fed covers up the problem with more monetary heroin. And then we have a bigger problem. And so we had a massive problem that erupted in 2008. And this one's going to be worse because we have a lot more debt now than we had then. That's why the problems weren't a crisis, because they hadn't developed to this degree. But now every problem is a crisis. That's why when they did QE the first time, they said it's a one-off event. We're never going to do it again. I knew in the beginning that that was a lie, that once they did it, they were committed. They had checked us into a monetary roach motel. There was no way out. I said it from day one. I said it in 2008, and I was right. 
and I warned about hyperinflation and people were laughing at me because it hadn't happened. It just hadn't happened yet. It's going to happen. And even if it's not hyperinflation, it's going to be massive. We've already got the worst inflation in 30 or 40 years. And in fact, if they measured it honestly, last year was really the worst inflation ever. It was worse than any year of the 1970s if we use the same CPI that was in use in the 1970s. Anyway, let me take another break. We got one more commercial uh, from our sponsors, and then I'll be back and answer the rest of the questions uh, commercial free. I've been in the investment business my entire life, and one of the biggest mistakes that a lot of people make when it comes to investing is confusing their insurance policy with an investment. And that's because a lot of salesmen talk people into buying whole life policies under the guise of making investments when what they really need is a term policy. Because with term life insurance, you get to maximize the death benefit while minimizing the premiums, freeing up more money to make investments that will yield much better returns than what's available inside a whole life policy. And that's where Ladder comes in. Ladder is 100% digital when you apply for up to $3 million in coverage or less. There are no doctors, no needles, and no paperwork. To apply, you just need a phone and a laptop and a few spare minutes. Ladder's smart algorithms work in real time, so you'll find out instantly if you've been approved. And there are no hidden fees, and you can cancel any time. And if you change your mind the first 30 days, you'll get a full refund. Ladder's policies are issued by insurers with long proven histories of paying claims. And since life insurance costs more as you get older, now's the best time to cross that off your list. So go to ladderlife.com slash gold today to see if you're instantly approved. That's L-A-D-D-E-R life.com slash gold to see if you're instantly approved. Next question is coming from Paul Sung. $20 question. Wants to know if I can explain how the manipulation can affect the price of paper gold and not affect the, affect the actual commodities. And you know, in my gold business, and I just experienced this through the bank, because the bank had a lot of gold, and we're trying to move that gold out, and some of it needed to be liquidated, the bank's hedge book, and I was talking to the company that was storing all the bars, and he was commenting on this huge surge in premiums for physical bars of gold and silver. He's never seen them this high in his life. There's tremendous demand. Even as the price was dropping, demand was surging around the world because obviously, look, there's inflation. People are looking for a real hedge, and so they're trying to buy gold and silver. But again, the big money, the speculators, all they're doing is looking at the interest rates and the Fed, and they've got these computer algorithms that are like, oh, bonds down, interest rates up, sell gold. Right? They just think that higher interest rates are bad for gold. They don't get it. These are just higher nominal interest rates. They're not higher real interest rates. In fact, we still have negative interest rates. We we've, haven't we've even come close to positive interest rates. We have been in a bullish environment for gold the entire time. It's just that these computer algorithms don't get that. But the big money has been trading in the futures market. And so that has kind of been the, um, the, the, the dog wagging the tail of the physical market. But at some point, and maybe soon, Maybe this week, who knows? That's going to flip. Because the big money is going to figure out they're on the wrong side of this trade, especially the ones that are short. And given what I know about the shortage in the physical market, it's possible that people that actually want physical gold may be buying some of these contracts looking to take physical delivery, which is going to be a shock to the shorts when they're forced to deliver gold that they don't have. Remember, all the people that are selling gold and silver futures contracts, unless they're a hedger, unless they're a you know, mining company, right, and they're hedging, if they're a speculator and they're just short in gold and silver, they don't actually have any. You know, like when you short a stock, you're supposed to have the stock, right? You have to own the stock. You borrow it. If you don't have it, you get the shares, and then you sell them. But, you know, you sell futures on gold and silver. You don't have to have any gold and silver at all. Well, Normally, it doesn't matter that you don't have it because the guy that bought it, he don't want it either, right? Everybody settles up in cash. But what happens if the long decides to tell the futures exchange, yeah, you know, I actually want my, my gold. You know, here's my address. Send it to me. Send me my bars. Now, the exchange has to send a notice to the guy who's short saying, hey, you know, you remember that silver you sold or that gold you sold? Yeah, you got to deliver it. Here's the address you got to send it to. And he's like, Shit, I don't have it. How am I going to get it? 
you know, and, and so now he's got to buy out his way out of that contract unless he's going to go find that, that physical metal. I mean, it's the opposite of what happened with oil. Remember when oil prices went negative, went to negative $30 a barrel during COVID? Why was that? Well, because the people who bought the contracts were being forced to take delivery. The, sh the people who sold the oil, right, they, they didn't want the oil. So they said, I'm going to deliver it. I got no place for it. And so then the people who own the contracts were being told, yeah, we're going to deliver all this oil to you. Where do you want it? And I, I, I don't want it. So now they had to pay people to take it off their hands. So people were paying $30 a barrel so they didn't have to take delivery of the oil, right? And so you saw that crazy market. Well, you're going to see something as crazy as that on the upside of gold when people are scrambling to deliver on the gold contracts when they can't find the physical metal. So that's all coming. So that's why, look, I tell people just, you know, buy your gold, buy your silver while you can get it because at some point you won't be able to get it because the people are going to figure out what's happening. Just like, you know, the subprime market imploded all at once. It was obvious for years to me, but even within weeks of the implosion, people were still buying that crap and paying above par. Then all of a sudden, Emperor has no clothes, and in a matter of a week, everything went to zero. So when this thing turns, it's going to unravel. That's why, again, I keep saying you can't wait. You can't try to be so cute and finesse this. you got to be willing to be early. All right, I was way early. I was more than a decade early. Okay, but you know what am I going to do? I see this stuff way in advance because to me, it's that crystal clear. But I also can see that we're so much closer right now. It is not worth betting that they're going to be able to pull another rabbit out of their hat. Next question is from Nathan G. It's a $50 question. Can you go deeper into debt borrowing from the future? Debt is actually using other people's savings plus leverage on a global scale, hundreds of trillions. In debt. What is the long-term harm from wiping out or defaulting on debt? Well, the problem is savings are really the lifeblood of economic growth because savings under consumption is where a capital investment comes from. You know, get my book, How an Economy Grows and why it crashes. We, you know, it's a very simple way of explaining this important concept. But if you wipe out everybody's debt, you wipe out everybody's savings. And that is a disaster uh, to wipe out the savings because now, you know, you, you, know, you turn back the clock because now you got to reaccumulate. Uh, you have no more money to loan out to finance things. And, you know, people were expecting to live off those savings. You know, yeah, it's a great when people no longer have debt, but one person's liability is somebody's asset. There are a lot of people that are planning on retiring. They're, not, they're gonna have to come up with a new plan. They ain't gonna retire. They're gonna have to keep working because they've been wiped out. So look, this, you know, this is gonna be a terrible thing that's gonna happen, um, but there is a silver lining in that if it's a catalyst, for countries to re-embrace free market capitalism. And maybe for some countries it will be. But for other countries, it may be a catalyst to go all in on government and become totalitarian uh, states. Uh, and you just got to get the hell out of those countries as fast as you can, even if that is the United States. I don't know. I hope that's not going to be the United States. But, you know, it, it may be. I mean, because I'm not necessarily going to get what I hope for. We're going to get what the political reality is. And unfortunately, uh, the, the, the electorate has been dumbed down over, uh, over the decades. And so they may just go for socialism. That's just how dumb uh, most Americans are when it comes to understanding of economics. Next question. $20 question from, don't worry, doesn't really say. What is advantage of GDX over GLD? All right, well, they're very different. So GDX is an index of gold mining stocks. GLD is an ETF of gold bullion. So when you're buying GLD, you're buying physical gold. Now, same thing as like somebody called up early about Kinesis. Same thing. By Kinesis, you're buying physical gold. It's like buying GLD, except I can't send my GLD uh, to my buddy you know, in Europe, or I can't use my GLD to go to Starbucks and buy a cup of coffee like you could in theory uh, with Kinesis or with G-Coin or any one of these 
uh, tokens that's backed by gold. So, but they're like an ETF, right? Because you have the gold there and then there's a share associated with it as opposed to a, a token that, that's been created. But GDX is just a diversified basket of mining stocks. Now, personally, I think my portfolio that Adrian Day manages at my gold fund, the Euro Pacific Gold Fund, or the separately managed accounts that Adrian manages for my clients, I think Adrian is smart enough to beat an index. Because the thing with the index is it just buys everything. But I think Adrian can figure out which stocks are better to own and which stocks are better to avoid. You know, he's been doing this for 40 years. He knows the mining sector. He doesn't have to buy an index. You buy the index when you don't know what you're doing. And that way, oh, I'm not going to make a mistake. I'm just going to buy the index. Now, sometimes you buy it because there's more liquidity there, right, than any one individual name. You're a big fund. Okay, I'm going to buy the index because, you know, I don't have enough liquidity in some of these names. But if you're an individual investor, you don't have to do that. Buy the Euro Pacific Gold Fund. Set up a managed account with me. Let Adrian Day build you a portfolio. He will beat these indexes. I'm confident of that. He's done it for 30 or 40 years. And, you know, he doesn't compete against that many people. There's not a lot of smart people who are managing gold portfolios or silver mining stocks. They, they're, they're, all, they're in tech. They're in biotech. They're in, they're in something sexier. Right? It's not like the, the smartest people are, are becoming engineer. I mean, uh, geologists. And, you know, nobody cares about mining. All the, the big investment banking deals don't happen in mining. Right? It's been in a bear market for so long. So Adrian is just, you know, he's playing a game, you know, with a bunch of lightweights. So he's able to find the value that other people can't find. And, and so I think that we're going to way outperform the, the mining stocks that you would get if you just, if you just bought everything. I think that he's going to buy the stuff that's going to go up more and not buy the stuff that's going to go up less or maybe even the stuff that goes to zero. I think he, he knows the difference. And so... If you want to be in gold stocks, um, then I think you look into the Euro Pacific Gold Fund and separately managed accounts, knowing they have a lot more risk because you're investing in a company. You're a stockholder in a business. A lot can go wrong. That's very different than buying physical gold, let's say at Shift Gold, or you know, buying uh, an ETF like GLD. That, to me, is an alternative form of liquidity. That's real money versus owning dollars or euros or yen. Yes, it's going to have a little bit more volatility. But look, the gold made an all-time record high last week in British pounds. No one talks about that. When the pound was crashing, gold was the lifeline in the UK. It made an all-time record high. And think about that idiot, Chancellor of the Exchequer, in 1999, Gordon Brown, right, that was his name, sold all of Britain's gold when it was under, it was like $260. It, I forget the pound price. But since Britain sold its gold 10 years ago, the price of gold is up tenfold, 10x in terms of British pounds. What a horrible, horrible trade uh, that was. Uh, the British are going to have to buy more gold eventually, and it's going to be at a much higher price than it is now, let alone where they sold it. Next question, Deep's $20 question. Are you investing in BRIC nations? If not, what's your favorite? Yes, we have an emerging market fund at Euro Pacific, and we have investments there. Look, look what happened to Brazil today. Some of our Brazilian names were up more than 20% in one day. My emerging market fund had a 10% winning to Brazil. Um, and you know, I own some of these Brazilian stocks. Now, part of that was due to the election, but look, Brazil's got a lot of natural resources. I mean, I mean, I'm, it's not my favorite country economically, but as an investment, I can look at it and I can see that you know, there's some cheap stocks and there's a lot of upside there. Um, but Russia, you know, I mean, a lot, nobody wants to invest there. It's a four letter word and we don't have any investments there, but I have a feeling that the people who are investing there are going to make a lot of money. Same thing in China, the people that are, that are, that are investing over there. You know, everybody's worried about the problems in China. They forget there are a lot of good things in China too. Not that there aren't any problems there. Sure. There are problems, but the, the positives far outweigh the negatives. People don't, you know, understand that they, they, they don't, they don't see that. Uh, but in the United States, it's the negatives right now that way outweigh the positives. All right, so Mike Pranka, $20 question. What's the best to do with $500 right now? Well, I mean, if you're talking about investing $500, I guess buy some silver, right? You can just go and buy some silver with 500 bucks. 
because I think silver is going a lot higher. Oh, excuse me. That was changed to $500,000, not $500. All right, well, that's a little bit different. You can still buy some silver if you got $500,000, but you can afford to diversify. In fact, most of that money, you can use it to set up a managed account with me at Euro Pacific Asset Management, and I can manage your portfolio for you uh, and help diversify it around the world into the assets that will actually provide real returns adjusted for inflation. You know, most people are not going to be able to keep up with inflation. You have to buy real companies that earn money today, not that might earn money in the future, you know, but don't earn it today. And a lot of these companies will never earn money in the future. You need earnings now and you need pricing power. You need people who are selling products that you have to buy. I mentioned some of the earnings that came out of Apple. People aren't buying the iPhone 14. Do they need an iPhone 14? No. They still got an iPhone 13, an iPhone 12, they, they, they work just as good. Look, I'm not even upgrading mine. I still got an iPhone 12. I didn't buy the 14. I didn't buy the 13. If I'm not buying it, right, I mean, what's the big deal? But people aren't going to do it. Um, Nike, right? Do you need a new pair of Nikes? No, you don't. You know, you can buy a cheaper brand if, you're, if, you're, if you have holes in your shoes. But most people, you know, you can keep wearing the, the older ones. You don't need the new one. You got to own companies that sell stuff that people need, like food. Right? You got to buy food every week. You got to keep on eating. There's no way around it. Yes, you can eat a little less, but there's a limit to what you can give up. And people will give up other things before they give up eating. Right? So you want to sell products that people need. Look, we own a lot of tobacco stocks. Look, people are going to smoke. I, I'm not glad that people are smoking, but the people who smoke, they're going to smoke. Right? If they haven't quit by now, they ain't quitting. And if the price of cigarettes go up, well, they're giving up something else because they're not giving up cigarettes, right? The fact that they cause cancer and they're still smoking, they derive enough pleasure from smoking that they don't care if they risk getting cancer, right? Cigarette prices go up, people are going to buy, right? Energy, look, people need energy. Yes, you can use less energy, but you can't use no energy. Believe me, I tried it in Rico. It ain't fun, right? So people are going to pay higher prices for energy. You got to sell people things that they need, not that they just want. That's the stuff they're going to give up on. So you got to own companies that sell the stuff that people need, and you can raise prices, and people will still buy, right? And and, and, and then the dividends can go up, and then you can stay ahead of inflation. And that's what these portfolios are going to do. But also, you have to recognize that the world is going to change. When the dollar collapses, and it's no longer the reserve currency, and we can no longer act as a parasite on the world, we can't suck up all the goods that the rest of the world produces, now the rest of the world is going to have a lot more stuff, and they're going to be better off. Right? The world is not better off because they're holding a pile of our paper. They're worse off. We're better off because we get their stuff, and they get our paper. Well, when they keep their stuff and we keep our paper, the world is better off, and we're worse off. And if the world is better off, then you're better off investing in those countries that are going to benefit from the dollar's collapse. You don't want to have your assets here because Americans are going to be a lot poorer at the end of all this because we are living an artificially high standard based on the fact that the dollar is the reserve currency. Well, this crisis is going to end that reign. I think gold is going to replace the dollar. I don't think it's going to be the euro or the, uh, the yen or the RMB or some you know, special drawing rights coming out of um, uh, the SDR. Everybody's going back to gold. I mean, that's where everybody always goes back to gold, right? Nothing has changed, and no one's going to Bitcoin. Don't think, no, 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 it's going to be Bitcoin. That's a pipe dream. It ain't never going to happen. And don't hold on to that fantasy to zero, right? If you're listening to this and you're still in Bitcoin, look, it's still above 19,000, so get out, right? 19,650 as I am doing this podcast. Cesar Sandoval, $50 question. What's the point of owning stocks in the case of monetary financial crisis when currencies are headed to zero? Well, but currencies are headed to zero, not the stocks, right? When you own a stock, you own a business, you own an asset, right? It's like owning real estate. Now, you can own a piece of real estate yourself, or you can own a REIT. You can own a corporation that has a real estate portfolio. So, 
I can either start my own business or I can invest in somebody else's business by buying shares of stock. Those are real things. Look, the uh, hyperinflation in the Weimar Republic, Germany, right, wiped out the Reichsmark. But um, companies didn't get wiped out. Look, I mean, I'm, you know, uh, um, Mercedes, Daimler, that, you know, they were, you know, they, they, they were around. They were making tanks back then or cars before uh, World War II, before the Weimar Republic. Uh, even, you know, companies in Zimbabwe survived. Some of them, they, would, they didn't get nationalized. But in Argentina, you know, you own a real thing when you own stock. And so if you get hyperinflation, yeah, maybe a stock you bought for $100 a share will be $100 million a share, right? But you're still going to own that stock, right? And, you know, your dividend is going to go up. Uh, it's a real thing. <coughs> so it is a hedge. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> but, of course, you have to own a good business. You can't just buy the type of stuff that's been going up. In this mania, with low inflation and low interest rates, People were betting on tech stocks. They were buying stories. They were buying hype. They were buying earnings 50, 100 years from now because interest rates were zero. There was no discount rate. So forget about that. Those stocks ain't going to work. The stocks that are going to work are basic businesses that are not sexy stories, that are real, right? Companies, again, that are selling stuff and paying dividends. But the best values are going to be overseas because there you're going to get the, the added benefit of the foreign exchange. Because if the dollar goes way down against these other currencies, then the prices are going to go up a lot more. What do you think about the Verscon Pamp gold bars? Not really sure what those are. It sounds like the Van Canby bars. Those I like. I promoted them a lot uh, when I first started selling them at Shift Gold. But I'm not really sure about this, uh, this other type of gold bar. Um, let me see. Oh, Bell Canby. Okay, yeah. <laughs> All right. So, uh, yeah, I liked it. Yeah, that, 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 it sounded like Van Canby. Whoever, whoever was uh, typing it up, uh, I don't know how, how it got typed up that way. But, yeah, I mean, those are great little bars. I did a video you, if you just Google it on YouTube. But you can take a bar of gold and you can break this into 50 little squares. Each one is a gram. So it's a 50-gram 50, 50, uh, bar. Uh, you know, it's like a, it's like a card. As, and then you can peel off little grams, and then you can, you know, use them as barter. But again, the, I think it's even better to have the, the digital currency backed by gold, because then you can break it down into tiny little specks, you know, and spend those. And of course, in order for me to spend the Valcambi, I got to be able to hand it to you. So I can't send it to somebody, you know, in Australia unless I want to mail it to them, right, which is going to take some time to get delivered. And maybe it'll get lost in the mail. But if I can transfer it, the ownership digitally, instantaneously for free, uh, or practically free, uh, that's a better way to do it. But what I really like, too, is just the, the barter bags. I sell a lot of one-ounce silver rounds. I think those are more ideal for in-person transactions. Because at some point in time, and it may be very soon, we're going to have price controls in America. No question in my mind that we're going to get price controls when prices really start to go out of control. They're already, they're already doing that in the UK with energy, but it's going to happen here. We did it in the 1970s, so you know, we're going to do it again. And when there's price controls, there's shortages. There's black markets. And the black market currency of choice is probably going to be silver. So if you want to buy stuff in an economy where there's rationing and shortages in black markets, you better have yourself some silver. So you can go up and call up Shift Gold and tell them you want, uh, want a barter bag. You know, we sell those. Silver still, you know, it's now it's back above twenty dollars an ounce, but almost twenty-one. It was down at what sixteen, seventeen bucks last month. But remember, silver was at fifty bucks in two thousand and eleven. Hell, it was at fifty bucks in nineteen eighty. So you know, twenty bucks is still a steal for an ounce of silver. <clears throat> okay, next question, ten bucks. You always address the price action of gold, GDX, GDXJ, on your podcast. Can you add an international and EM stock on a regular basis since these make the majority of your investment strategy? Yeah, you know, I, I don't like to talk about the individual stocks. I, I am, though, going to be giving up. That's something that I want to do. And hopefully by next year, I'm going to be giving up all of my FINRA licenses. 
and then I'll be able to talk more freely about individual stocks. You know, I'm tired of these government regulations. They really, you know, encumber the things that I can say. I'm tired of dealing with them. And so I will be able to speak more openly on individual stocks once I'm no longer a licensed stockbroker. Now, people think, oh, if I'm not a licensed stockbroker, how am I going to work with you, Peter Schiff? Well, I really haven't been getting on the phone and giving stock recommendations to people in years. What I've been mainly doing is helping manage portfolios. I don't need those licenses to do that. I only need those licenses to earn a commission on a stock transaction. And I really haven't been doing that in years, but I've still been a licensed member anyway. And I do have people that have been working for me that have been engaging in those transactions, but I have not been doing it personally. So I'm going to be uh, distancing myself. Oh, and by the way, I might as well put that out there. At some point soon, I am going to be changing the website. Right now, you know, where I sold my broker dealer uh, years ago. And the company that bought it renamed it Alliance Global Partners. They're a great group of guys. I still work closely with them. Uh, but what happened was when they changed the name of the company, they kept the Euro Pacific Capital brand and my website is there. But I've always been planning on moving it. <clears throat> and now I'm going to do that. And so I'm going to take that website and move it to Euro Pacific Asset Management. So at some point, you're going to go to that website if you're a client of, Europe, of uh, Alliance Global Partners. You're going to go to the website, Europac Capital, and you're going to be on the website for Euro Pacific Asset Management. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to provide a link in case you missed it that will link you back to the Alliance Global Partners site where you can go and check your, your brokerage account. But I want to bring all that branding back to my asset management company because I've got too many different brands. I've got Euro Pacific Capital. I've got Euro Pacific Asset Management. I kind of want to consolidate all that into Euro Pacific Asset Management. But nothing's going to change from the perspective of my clients. I'm still managing the portfolios for the accounts over at AGP. I'm managing the portfolios for the accounts over at Euro Pacific Asset Management here in Puerto Rico. I just want to kind of consolidate uh, the branding is to make it to make it less confusing. <coughs> but if you've got an account with me now and we're managing it, <coughs> that's not going to change. The same team in Puerto Rico is managing the accounts <coughs> for both of these entities. <coughs> um, Next question from Canada. Thoughts on Zing's announcement of dumping U.S. bonds? I read that. I retweeted that. Look, you never know. The Chinese talking about dumping dollars. They've got a lot of dollars to dump. They've got over a trillion. Uh, so does Japan. The yen is getting killed. The Chinese RMB is going down. The only way these currencies can go up is if they start selling their dollars. They start selling their U.S. treasuries. And what does that do? that pushes the inflation back to America because now the dollar starts to go. Interest rates start to go up. I mean, the world has been, you know, propping us up. We've been exporting our inflation. They can send it back to us by intervening in these currency markets, but by not hoarding U.S. dollars, moving away from the U.S. dollar, moving out of U.S. treasuries. Now, the Chinese were making some noise about doing that. I don't know. I mean, I've always thought that if they were going to do it, they wouldn't telegraph it first. They would just do it. You would find out that they did it after the fact. You would see the collapsing dollar. You would see the collapsing bond market. They wouldn't be talking about what they're going to do, right? Why would you do that? If you were planning on making a big sale, you wouldn't alert everybody that you were going to do it because then maybe you wouldn't get a good price. People would start front running what you had intended to do. You want to take the market by surprise, right? You don't, you don't want to telegraph what you're going to do. You, you hope nobody notices it and you get to do it, you know, uh, without anybody figuring out. But of course, they're such a big player that if they really start to meaningfully move out of the dollar, people are going to figure it out. But you figure they want to get rid of as many dollars as they can before the word gets out that they're selling. Same thing with their, with their treasuries. <clears throat> uh, Paul Sung, when your predictions come to pass, will owning GLD actually help protect my wealth? Yes, I think it will. Now, the risk is that <clears throat> GLD doesn't actually have the gold. That's, that's not, the risk isn't zero. I don't know how high it is. I mean, I assume that the accounting is honest. But again, you know, you don't have to take a chance. You don't have to buy GLD. Just buy the gold. It's not hard to store. I mean, we'll ship it to you. You can store it, you know, at Shift Gold. So you don't have to do it at GLD. 
you know, or you could get into, again, like, you know, somebody mentioned uh, uh, the Kinesis platform. I mean, there, there are other ways of owning gold with a third party than having to trust an ETF. But, you know, how, you could have some of your money there. I just wouldn't have anywhere near all of it there just in case. I mean, you might as well uh, protect yourself and diversify where you custody your gold and custody some of it yourself. <clears throat> okay, Roberto Cabrera. If Schwab goes bankrupt and I have PM stocks in TD Ameritrade, do I lose money? Well, first of all, well, I, I don't know if Ameritrade clears through Schwab. Is that why you're trying to connect the two together? I'm not really sure. Um, but even if Schwab goes bankrupt and you have your money at Schwab, your stocks at Schwab, I still think you're okay because, you know, you're, you're not a, a creditor of Schwab. I mean, they're safekeeping your assets. The assets are segregated to you. Now, if you're in a margin account and you've, uh, you know, you got your, your securities in a type two margin account, then that can be different. Uh, so if you're worried about that, you know, don't, don't put your, your stocks in a margin account. Keep them in a, a cash account. But again, I don't think these big companies are going to go bankrupt. They would. Many of them would if the Fed actually was serious about bringing inflation back down to 2%. But they're not because they can't, so they won't. They're not going to let these big banks and the big brokerage houses fail, just like they didn't let them fail in 2008. It was a smart move. They should have let them fail, but they didn't. They let one fail, Lehman, and then when they saw what happened, they never let another one fail. Uh, and, and so they're, they're not going to do it. So I don't think these big brokerage firms are going to go out of business. Uh, I don't think the big banks are going to go out of business. Unfortunately, a lot of them should go out of business, but they won't because their friends in government will keep them in business but they're going to put the dollar out of business. That's what's going to happen. Uh, and they're going to put a lot of Americans out of business by wiping them out. Uh, so, yeah, I wouldn't be so worried about having my money at Schwab. What I would be worried about is what my money is invested in at Schwab. And you can get all my mutual funds on the Schwab platform, by the way. They're all there. Um, Graham Hammond. I've got a large sum of money in the bank and I'm worried about liquidity. Do you foresee a run on the bank? No, because I think the Fed is going to backstop the banks with inflation. There's going to be a run on the dollar, not a run on the bank. Now, if the Fed was serious and raised interest rates sufficiently, banks would fail and there'd be no FDIC to bail them out. So there would be bank runs. There won't be because the government's going to do the wrong thing. And that's one way you know. Doing the right thing is so politically painful that it, there's just no way it's going to happen. Charlie Kenko. I want to know what the Inflation Reduction Act and the Federal Excise uh, and the Federal Reserve Bank ex, uh, exercise they're about to mean for. Not really sure, but the Inflation Reduction Act was just a spending plan. It was a rebranded uh, Build Back Better uh, Green, Green New Deal kind of thing. Uh, the politicians just called it the Inflation Reduction Act because inflation was high and it was a problem and they wanted to pretend they were doing something about it. But in reality, what the bill did or the law is make it worse. So it should be called the Inflation you know, Acceleration Act. Um, when are going back to the U.S. stock markets after the Dow crash? Okay, are we going to go back to the U.S. market after the Dow crashes 70 to 80 percent? Well, I don't know if it's going to crash that much in nominal terms because they'll create a lot of inflation. But in terms of gold, yes, I do expect the price of the Dow Jones to crash by 70, 80 percent, maybe more. Will I buy those stocks when that happens? Hopefully, I hope I will, because if I'm buying them, that means we've done the right thing. We've made the correct adjustments and I'm buying. And I hope, you know, I hope when I pass away eventually that my entire portfolio is U.S. stocks. Nothing would make me happier than to own U.S. stocks. But I can't do that now because I know how badly they're going to perform. And we haven't even come close to doing the right thing. Uh, and I still don't know that we ever will. Okay, next question. Uh, John Muscuglio. Why is equity, bond, PMs, and pretty much everything else moving together? All right, so why are all of the markets correlated? Well, they're all trading off of the Fed. That's the problem. It's all, what's the Fed going to do? If the Fed is going to raise interest rates more, everything goes down. If they're going to raise rates less, 
everything goes up. And that shows you how screwed up the markets are when everything is based on the Fed. The Fed should be irrelevant. Nobody should care. The fact that the Fed is the single most important thing, the fact that everybody waits on pins and needles for these Fed announcements and these press conferences, this is not capitalism. In a free market economy, no one gives a damn what some central banker thinks. In fact, in a free market economy, there is no central banker. The fact that the government is so powerful in the markets and the economy, that's why the economy is so screwed up. We shouldn't be having any of this. Nobody should know the name of the Federal Reserve Chairman, right? Probably more people know the name of the Federal Reserve Chairman than the name of the Vice President. Anyway, coming up next, um, Chadwick Fairbanks. What are your thoughts on the DXY staying strong because of uh, what's been happening? Look, the dollar index is strong for the same reason that gold has been weak. And it's, it's hard to know what's the dog and what's the tail. But it's the high interest rates. And the Fed has been talking tougher than the ECB. Certainly, the Bank of Japan has done nothing. They've still got negative interest rates. Those idiots are still doing quantitative easing. Um, so the Fed has talked tough, but they haven't really acted tough. Yeah, they've raised rates recently, but where are we? We're at three and a quarter. Do you realize how low a rate that is, especially when inflation is eight? Yes, is it high compared to zero? But you know, when the Fed brought rates to zero, they were pretending inflation was below 2%. Well, now they're acknowledging it's 8%. So rates are actually lower now. Real rates are lower at three and a quarter than they were at zero. So this is actually worse for the dollar. This is actually better for gold. People haven't figured that out. Jared Cuts. M2 has been stable given current debt levels, interest rates, less than inflation rate. Um, can reduce M2 and stall borrowing and thus spending and new money creation. Look, money being created is like a, 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 you know, a heroin addict being supplied with heroin. If the money's creation slows down or reverses, everything implodes. So money supply is going to explode. There's no question in my mind that that is going to happen. Uh, it's already happened, and, it's, and money supply is going to grow even more. In fact, since COVID started, I forget what 40% of the money that's ever been created has been created in just a couple of years. Well, when this next recession kicks into a higher gear, see right now, they're still pretending that it's not a recession because the unemployment rate officially is still low. Well, once the unemployment rate spikes up, they, they can't pretend anymore. But then the budget deficits are just going to explode from where they already are, which is a couple of trillion a year. Uh, and then, of course, the money supply has to follow because how are they going to fund those deficits? They're going to create the money out of thin air to do it. Ron Edwards, 10 bucks. Is it better to store the metal or take delivery? It's better to do both, right? You can be diversified uh, in your metals. I had this earpiece on for the commercials. I just realized I, I don't need to wear it anymore. Um, but, yeah, it's not an all-or-nothing decision. I think that you should store some of your metals yourself, and then you should have other metals stored in other locations outside the United States. Play it safe, right? That way, if you have to leave the country, you know, you, you, know, you got metals. You got, you got real money stored someplace for you. And then, of course, these other, where I think we're all going to have metal in, in, in crypto. People are going to have their metal, their gold, in a vault somewhere, and they're going to be able to uh, immediately transact with it based on transferring the ownership of that gold instantly for free or practically free uh, using a blockchain or some other method that allows you some other system that allows you to transfer your ownership of that gold via the internet to somebody else and you can access it through an app on your phone and all these companies are going to be integrated with API they're going to be you know in Apple Pay, they're going to be with Visa, they're going to be with MasterCard, they're going to have their own cards. Uh, it's going to be very easy for people to put themselves on a gold center. That's what I want to do with my bank. That's been my goal all along. Problem was, it was taking us so long to comply with all these rules and regulations, and then eventually, despite complying with all the rules and regulations, to the point where you know it slowed everything down, the regulators now put the bank uh, out of business, and so. I'm not going to do this myself, but I'm going to partner up with somebody else who's doing it 
and I'm going to get involved in a big way in the next phase of the monetization of gold and the marriage of gold and, and, and blockchain and the internet, because that is the real innovation. Bitcoin and these other 20,000 uh, uh, fiat cryptocurrencies, that's all a sideshow. Yes, a lot of people got rich scamming people into this con, but a lot of people are also going to go broke. But at the end of the day, all that is doing is preparing the, the road for the real adaption of that technology when it's married to real money, uh, not these worthless tokens. Uh, next question. Uh, can I speak about the digital dollar and the Fed coin and all that? Um, yeah, look, I'm sure the government wants everybody with digital dollars because then they can track everything you do, right? When you have a paper bill and you go out and spend it, they don't know that you spent it. They, they can't see that transaction. Government is about control. Now, free people don't want to be controlled by government. Free people want a limited government. This is very dangerous to empower your government to have that kind of information on everything that you do. That power will always be used against you. Governments always claim, oh, we need this extra power to protect you from drug dealers or terrorists or money launderers. It's all BS. That's the excuse. They just want more power and control over the public. And the public should resist any, temp any move by government to expand its power. Unfortunately, the public has not been vigilant over the years, over the, the decades. And government has grown much bigger, and our freedoms have grown much smaller, and our standard of living is much lower collectively as a result of having bigger government. Not only do we give up our freedom, we give up our prosperity. I don't know. Somebody's saying something about these super chats. I don't know. I can't understand that. But I'm not skipping anything. I'm just, I'm just reading these. I'm not looking directly at the chat. They're getting typed up and put on a piece of paper, and I'm just scrolling down. So I'm not, I'm not discriminating against anybody. I'm just going right down on these chats. Um, has the bottom for gold really been set? Um, there's a good chance. I mean, look, nothing is impossible. If the Fed comes out and completely crushes the idea that they're anywhere near finishing these rate hikes, because the markets are now starting to price in a pivot sooner again. They're try they're, they now think that the terminal rate where, you know, the highest rates are going to go, they've now marked it down. So there's been a change in the perception. And if the, the Fed has to actually move to change that perception. And if they did it, could gold go down and make a new low? It could. But there's a good chance that we've seen the low. And to me, I would rather be in the market and take a chance that we may make a new low. And I'm, you know, obviously I could have bought it cheaper. I would rather do that than want to bet that there's going to be a new low and not buy and risk the low being in and never buying or buying at a much, much higher price. Because wherever the bottom is, if we haven't made it, it's not that far down. But the top is very far away. So don't be greedy about feeling you need to buy the absolute bottom, because you won't. Just be content that you're buying nowhere near the top. And I think you end up making a lot of money regardless in and, and again, in gold and silver, it's not about making money, it's preserving money. You preserve your wealth. You want to make money, I think, and you're willing to handle the risk, then you, you join me in the mining stocks and other types of stocks that I think are going to be very levered to this inflationary environment. It's not just stagflation. It's recession, depression, and high inflation. An inflationary depression is where we're going. And it may become hyperinflation, which is the worst of all possible outcomes, which is still, I don't think, the most likely scenario. But the probability of that outcome is a lot higher than it was a decade ago. And it was still a probable outcome a decade ago, just less 
probable than it is now. Okay. Okay, this one is from John Big Siglu. Follow up on my last question. What will it take for PMs to break away from other assets? Well, they've already kind of done that. The precious metal stocks, now everything rallied today. The Dow was up 750 points. I think at one point it was up 800 points. But last week, stocks were clobbered. Last week, the Dow, the S&P, the NASDAQ were down about 3% last week. Gold stocks were up. They were up 6 7 8% last week. Silver was up last week. Um, so we saw that kind of divergence last week where we saw the big rally in precious metal stocks and we saw the sell-off continue in the rest of the market. Now, today everything rallied, so it's hard to say. But keep an eye on that. But if we see more days like that, like last week, where we get upside in the mining stocks, but the overall market is weak, then that will show you. And that really is how they should trade. Because gold stocks were going down because everybody thought the Fed was going to win the inflation fight. When everybody realizes the Fed's going to lose the inflation fight, in fact, they're going to give up. They're, they're going to have to stop fighting because they can't. And inflation is going to fight harder. When inflation is winning, you want to own gold. And if you want to own gold, then you really want to own these mining stocks. So when people thought the Fed was going to win, they were selling the gold stocks. When they realize inflation is going to win, they're going to buy the gold stocks. Again, I'm betting on inflation because inflation is the coward's way out, and governments will always take the coward's way out. Um, Gigi is asking a question. How do you know an IPO valuation is, a, is appropriate? When Robinhood went public, look, there is no valuation. These stocks that were going public in the last couple of years, there was no value in these businesses. It was like a money grab. You know, Wall Street has an old expression. You, you feed the ducks when they're quacking, right? Well, the ducks were quacking for these crazy companies. The people that traded on Robinhood, they wanted to buy Robinhood stock. They wanted meme stocks. It's like, what's the valuation on a meme stock? A lot of these meme stocks were bankrupt. Nobody gave a damn that the companies were bankrupt and worthless. They just started buying them. You know, Robinhood is, I don't know, was it down 80, 90% since, since its peak? But they don't make any money. So how do you value a business that doesn't make any money? Because the value of a business is the value of the money that it makes. Now, if you have some kind of path to profitability and you're going to value the company based on what you think it's going to make but you have to have a realistic way of understanding what it's going to make but you also have to allow for the possibility that you're wrong i mean maybe it doesn't make anything how many companies were born out of the dot-com era that people thought were going to make a lot of money that never made any money and they went bankrupt see it's much safer to buy a stock that's been making money for 50 or 100 years right Pretty, it's pretty well likely to assume that they're going to keep making money. They're, they're doing something right. They're still in business, right? They haven't gone bankrupt yet. Uh, and so, and then you can look at the valuations. When you're buying the type of businesses I'm buying, it's very easy to value them. When you buy the type of crap that, that Kathy Wood was buying, there's no way to value them. So you make up ways. You remember during the internet, it was eyeballs, or they, had, they found some kind of cockamamie way to justify the unjustifiable, right? So I don't do that. There's some basics to valuing a company, and I only buy companies that you can value. I'm not going to reinvent some crazy way to justify overpaying for a stock. I don't want to overpay for a stock. I want to buy a stock that represents a good value and collect my dividends. So we've got a lot of good stocks in our portfolios. The Dividend Payers Fund, my value fund, we've got a lot of names there that I think are going to provide Significant inflation-adjusted returns. Um, uh, this is Dr. John Cardona. Just started a drop shipping jewelry business selling 925 sterling silver jewelry. Good time to start a business? Well, you know, you know, there's always going to be uncertainty when you start a business. 
question is, it depends on the kind of business that you're starting and who your customers are. So I don't really know that much about your particular business. But, you know, pe where people ultimately can make the most money is starting a business. I mean, that's one of the ways that people make a lot of money is starting a business. Now, of course, a lot of businesses fail. So a lot of people lose money starting a business. So, uh, but I, I, you know, I, I can't really give you uh, specifics. But I do think we're in a recession. And I think the recession is going to get worse. So obviously, it's going to be a challenging time for a lot of businesses. But some businesses will be able to do well. Uh, but a lot of businesses are going to fail. Um, Kevin Belcher, can the BRICS stand up to the U.S. and EU? Are they making their own <clears throat> separate monetary system? <clears throat> I think we're going to see uh, the East or the BRICS pushing away from uh, the West, pushing away from the dollar for sure, but to a lesser degree from Europe. Uh, because they can, ex they're seeing right now the consequences of the relationships that they have and how it's adversely affecting their own economies. And, you know, we've been, you know, riding on this gravy train in America for a long time. And that's, you know, something that Putin points out that he's corrected. I'm not like saying I, I'm a big Putin fan and there's a lot of things that he's done that I don't like. But, you know, he gets it when it comes to that. And if he gets it, other people are getting it. And so just read the writing on the wall, right? I mean, there is insurrection out there, right? The, the, it's going to be a revolution. The world is not going to stand for this anymore. Uh, and you better be prepared for that revolution. Okay, so this is what I'm, been t I'm being told to tell you, that the chats are being prioritized based on how much you're paying because obviously I'm, I'm not in fact I can't be here all night they got Monday night football coming up soon and I really don't want to compete with Monday night football in fact maybe this somebody could uh, can uh, give me a text like, usually it starts about 8 30 or something Eastern time so I don't want to keep going into in, you know into the kickoff because I'm I know I'm gonna lose people I'm not sure who's playing tonight um, but anyway so if you really want your your question answered just increase what you're paying and you'll jump to the top of the queue and your question is going to get answered. I have a feeling that a lot of questions are not going to get answered because I am going to, you know, run out of time, but I'll do more of these. I'm going to do more of these. So if you didn't get your question answered tonight, and of course, you know, I'm going to do more stuff on my locals channel. You know, I don't even have 2000 people yet that have signed up for locals. And, you know, I apologize that I haven't done more there. I've been so distracted with all kinds of crap that has been going on. My bank being just one of those things that I've had to do so much work on. Uh, and it's just a complete waste of my energy. And so are these lawsuits that I've been involved in. So I haven't really had a lot of the time. But sign up for locals. Pay the five bucks a month. Believe me, there's going to be a lot of added content. Now that I'm working on this studio, stuff is going to happen. I'm going to free up more time uh, in, in my life to do this stuff. Uh, so there'll be there'll be things that will be exclusive to locals. And there's still a lot of people that, you know, this is a live podcast. And my podcast that I'm putting out now, if you're not on locals, you're listening to them a day later. You're not getting them the night I do it. You're hearing them the following day. If you want to get the information fresh out of my mic, then then sign up for locals. And if you don't like commercials, look, we had two commercials on this podcast, but um, but if you don't want commercials, then there's no commercials on local, right? You get it's just like all these streaming services. You can have the commercial free, and then or which is more money, and you can you can get the commercials and and pay less. Uh, and so you know, I still have a free product. You get commercials, and you get it a day later. But if you want to get it earlier, join me on locals, and more stuff is coming. I promise, we're gonna do more. Stuff there. It's gonna be worth the five bucks. Um. Uh, Mitch, uh, when am I going back on Joe Rogan? You know, I was holding off on Joe Rogan. There was an announcement I really wanted to make. You know, I had, had some stuff I wanted to talk about. 
And so I kind of was keeping it in the back burner. I didn't realize I would have gone on because now it's been, the stuff is, I've been so sidetracked uh, that I haven't been able to talk about what I wanted to talk about. But, um, but if he had called me, I mean, if Joe would say, hey, Peter, I got to have you come on the show, you know, I probably would have done it. But as far as me, you know, being the, the squeaky wheel that gets greased, I haven't uh, reached out. But, you know, he's got a great audience. He's got a great platform. But I, I got also, I should fly out to Texas to do it. You know, it gets better when I do it in the studio. And that's just, you know, more traveling. Anyway, um, so Dr. John Caderno. I, okay, this is my, maybe this is another question. I thought I answered his question. But he's paying 50 bucks, so I got to give him a $50 answer. Mm. How much physical ounce of silver and gold would you recommend to the average American to have in their possession? Oh, not doctor, it's DJ. All right. Yeah. As a D DJ, not DR. Okay, did John. Okay. Well, the average American, right, probably hard, you know, he probably can't afford to buy much silver. The average American is broke. But I think all Americans should have some gold and silver. Um, I have generally been recommending 5 to 10% of an investment portfolio. So if somebody has $100,000, they should have five to 10000 in physical gold at a minimum. Now, you could have a little more if you want, uh, but you should at least have that. Uh, most Americans don't have anything. Uh, and then, you know, the other money you can invest in, in other types of assets, and that can include gold and silver mining stocks, too. Now, if you don't want any gold and silver mining stocks, you could have 20% in physical gold and silver, you know. But remember, gold and silver are non-productive assets. They don't throw off a dividend. They don't pay a yield. So I'd like the majority of your portfolio to be in investments. Now, over time, let's say investments get very expensive. Then you would have more gold because gold is a proxy for cash. But over the long run, you're going to be better off to have good investments. But if investments are very expensive and you don't want to buy them because they're overpriced, but there's inflation, what do you do with your money? Well, keeping it in gold and silver. So, um, but as a general rule, I think, you know, you have 5 or 10%, but, you know, if stocks are very expensive, you might want to have more than that because you don't want to buy stocks. You, you know, they're too expensive to buy. You can buy them with your gold. And even if your gold goes down, remember, let's say you buy gold at 1700 an ounce, which is where it is now, and you sell some stocks and you buy gold because you think the stocks are expensive. Well, what if your gold goes down by 20%, but the stocks you sold go down by 70%? Well, you could sell the gold and buy back those stocks. You're way better off. doesn't matter that the gold went down. What matters is, did what you sell went down more? It's all relative. What is gold worth relative to everything else? Now, okay, you would have been better off if you just held cash, but what if there's massive inflation and the stocks you sold double, but the gold you bought triple? See, the dollars will stay the same. So I think you're better off with gold and silver instead of dollars because there's a lot of risk that the dollar goes down, much more than gold and silver going down. And even if your gold and silver go down, stocks, real estate will go down more. So you're still better off being in gold. But if there's massive inflation, then you're, you're, hard, it's, you're terrible being in dollars. You're better staying, off, staying in the stock market than going into dollars, but you're much better off switching into gold. Okay, next question. Uh, thinking about small business here in the USA, will you talk about the credit markets? Alternative lending. Look, credit is going to dry up, clearly, because the government's been creating it out of thin air. But you know what's going to ultimately happen? A lot of these gold platforms that are going to be remonetizing gold, that's where the savings are going to be. And to the extent that people want to earn interest on their gold, they'll be able to. And, you'll, you know, they'll be able to loan it out in the way banks loan out. And you'll be able to buy a CD denominated in gold. And then, uh, you know, you can earn interest in gold. So uh, all this is going to happen. I mean, the markets are going to find a way to evolve. But remember, the only way to have real savings is somebody has to not spend. Somebody has to underconsume. For one person to borrow... Somebody else has to save. You know, the Federal Reserve tried to get around that. Like, well, we'll just print money. Nobody has to save. Everybody can spend. That doesn't work. That's why the economy is such a basket case. That's why they've kept interest rates at zero. 
You think they did that because we had a healthy economy? is going to kill it. That's the problem. Chris says, I need to buy a house next June to live in. What will the housing market look like next summer? Look, I don't know for sure. Housing prices should go down. Uh, now, if the Fed pivots and starts cutting rates, they probably won't. You know, I've got mixed feelings about Puerto Rico. Um, I'm not nearly as um, enamored with it as I was when I moved here. So I, I, I'm, I, you know, I don't, it's, look, the, the tax savings are there. The question is how much longer are they going to stay here? I don't know. And even though these tax degrees are supposed to be binding, I don't know if I'm as confident about that as I was when I first got here, given the experience that I'd been through since I've been here. So I don't know. You know, you got to decide on your I'm no longer recommending that people move here officially. I mean, you got to make a decision. Well, now, I'm not leaving. I'm already here. I haven't left. So you can, you can, you know, take that for what it is. Thought about it. Thought about leaving. Um, but you know, there's going to be massive inflation. I'm sure of that. So zero capital gains, I think, is important. But the question is, you know, will the commitments be honored? I, you know, I, I, I can't say. I can't say. Um, anyway, what is my estimate of copper versus gold over the next 10 years? Look, I think gold's going to do better, but I like copper. I like copper a lot. I've, I've got uh, a big investment position in copper. I've got a big position in nickel. Uh, you know, I, I, these are key industrial metals. Also, if you're going to see more electric vehicles, uh, these metals are going to be in demand. I don't think there's been nearly enough investment in uh, developing uh, copper mines over the last 10, 20 years. Uh, I think these metals are, are going a lot higher. Um, and, and so I, I want to own them. I mean, I think, you know, all res resources, commodities are, are going higher. I mean, that, that's the era that we're in. And that's where people are going to make a lot of money. I mean, people are going to lose a lot of money in technology stocks, in, in cryptocurrency, and all this, you know, this stuff that made, made people money during the bubble. At, at all the places that people got rich during the bubble, that's where they're all going to go broke when the air comes out. And even if the Fed turns on the printing presses, the air is still coming out in real terms uh, because they're not going to be able to pretend there's inflation anymore. It only worked so long as they can pretend inflation was under 2%. They can't pretend that inflation is never going back below 2%. I mean, it will eventually, but in the foreseeable future, in the lifetime of the typical investor right now, you're not going to see it. It's not going to happen. What we experienced during the 2000s and the 2010s, that was a fluke. Right? What we're experiencing now, this is reality. And it's going to get worse. Inflation is going up, not down. Um, so, Marquito Pitts, hey, Peter, what's your thought on buying gold via Glint Pay? Yeah, that's what, you know, Glint Pay, I met those guys a long time ago on their platform. They actually went bankrupt once, and then they came out of bankruptcy. So, I haven't really uh, been looking at them. Again, remember I said I've been looking at a lot of companies. That's not really one of them where I was interested. Um, but I don't really know exactly where they are. When I looked at it before, I wasn't, like, I didn't think it was the greatest of the, the, the programs out there. But again, you know, their, their, their heart's in the right place. Um, I, 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 I think I, what they're doing is where we're headed. There may be better ways of doing it, more efficient ways of doing it. 
than the platform they've built. In fact, I've seen other platforms that I think are a, a lot more advanced and I think are uh, going to be better. Um, now, you know, but, you know, would it, would it be bad to have money there? Probably not. I mean, I don't know. I, I, I don't, and I never, I didn't open up an account there, and I haven't invested any money there. Um, but, you know, look, they're, they, they've been around. You know, they're, they, this is where we're going, right? It's just that there hasn't been a lot of demand for this because gold has been out of favor, and I know that, you know, selling gold through shift gold. I mean, you know, people still don't want gold. It's, they, they still, you know, you know, don't like it. And then this whole crypto fad has been very bad for gold because it's, why buy gold? Hey, Bitcoin is better than gold. It's digital gold. It's better than gold. It goes up more. You know, who the hell wants real gold when you got this, right? So that has been negative publicity. And people haven't wanted, you know, I don't want a cryptocurrency backed by gold. It's not going to go to the moon, right? It only goes where gold goes. So people were buying these things as, as a dream, as a lottery ticket. So once all these speculators get wiped out, then it'll be more easy to, for this message to get out of gold as real money. And there are going to be a number of companies that are going to come out. And I'm going to get involved. I'm going to get involved with one of them, uh, the one that I think is the best. And, um, and I want to help drive this revolution. I guess that's what it is, a monetary revolution. The people have to take back monetary power from the governments, from the central banks. They're not going to do it with Bitcoin, right? It's not going to happen because it can't work with Bitcoin. It can work with gold because it worked with gold before. The people made a gold standard. The people made gold money, not governments. Governments used gold because that was the money that was in circulation. That was what the people decided to use. The government didn't decide that gold was money. Gold was money before the governments were created. And so the governments needed money to survive. And what did governments do? They took the money and they made coins out of it. They made official coins. The problem was when they debased those coins, that's where the word comes from. Debasing a coin is when you take a coin made of gold and silver and you stick a base metal in it so you can create more coins and you can inflate the money supply, right? Inflation started with precious metals, right? That's where it came from. Before they invented the printing press, they, 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 they were inflating the supply of coins. But the, the free market decided what money was. Government decided to make money paper. Right? The free market wouldn't be dumb enough to have fiat money, although they're dumb enough to have fiat cryptos, right? That was something. But, you know, something dumb can only go on until the dumb people lose their money. And I'm not saying dumb in the sense that they're stupid. There's some really smart people that own cryptocurrencies. Right? I mean, I'm not saying that you know, people that own them are idiots. There's some people a lot smarter than me, much higher IQs than I have, that, that are in crypto. You know, I, a lot of people live in my community. Very smart people are involved in this. They're, they're, they're smart, but they're too smart. They, 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 they're outsmarted themselves. They don't see the forest for the trees. And there are a lot of smart people that have lost money in the markets, and they're going to lose money in crypto because this... You know, scheme can't go on. It's a Ponzi, it's a pyramid, a chain letter, whatever you want to call it. All right, let me get to uh, this one more question. I'll make this uh, the last question. I know there's still a bunch of questions here, but this one is Dumb Money Media. And he says, give silver wafers. A gander if you're curious. Okay, I don't know what silver wafers is. I'm attempting to get a younger crowd involved in sound money. Okay, I guess someone just bought a $20 commercial for silver wafers because I have no idea what that one is. Um, but, you know, I'll, I'll, maybe I'll take a look at it. But anyway, unless somebody, I mean, there's a bunch of, you know, $5 questions, I guess, unless somebody wants to pay up. Um, for their for their five hour question, I guess I just got to end it because I can't just keep taking these questions because I know it's going to be eight thirty. Maybe I'll do a couple of them. I'll go until eight thirty, and then I think the game is starting. Pine Barren, uh, big move in silver. What's going on? Look, this is probably the new bull market where silver uh, is showing relative strength against gold. Silver is gaining on gold. That's what happens in a bull market, and we could be early in a bull market. Joel Hathaway. How do you think the coming recession will affect the average family? 
It's going to decimate the average family. They're going to get killed. A lot of people are going to lose their jobs and prices are going up. Food is going to get very expensive, energy. Look, people are going to get decimated. People are going to be impoverished. And this is not capitalism. This is all the government's doing. The government did this. The Federal Reserve did this. Uh, and don't let the government try to con you into thinking that this is some failure of capitalism that requires more government. It's a failure of government that requires more capitalism. Griffin DeWitt, can you explain the difference between lowering federal funds rate and quantitative easing? Quantitative easing is printing money. That's literally creating inflation. The Federal Reserve creates money and buys government bonds. The Fed funds rate is just the interest rate that the Fed controls uh, that banks are paying to borrow money. So they have two tools of monetary policy. They can raise and lower interest rates, and they can expand the money supply, contract the money supply. They shouldn't be doing either, and the market should set interest rates, not the Federal Reserve. Like, you don't want the government setting prices. The government shouldn't set the price of bread. We don't have a Politburo here setting the price of money. We want money to interest rates to be determined in a free market. We have not had a free market in a long time, and we have massive distortion. If the government controlled the price of bread, we'd have surpluses, we'd have shortages, we'd have big problems. So we don't do that. We let the market price bread. Well, we should let the market price interest rates because it's, an it's an even more important price. It's the price of money. And money is one half of every transaction. And all these transactions are wrong because of government manipulation. Team Basilic, what are your thoughts on platinum, rhodium, palladium? Again, all these metals are going up. I don't know which one is going up the most. I know all these resources, anything that's real is going to get more expensive because the government can't print rhodium. They can't print palladium, right? That has to be mined out of the ground. It takes a lot of resources to get it. And so that stuff is going to go up in value. Bud, sir, which commodity stock should we be buying? Look, I'm not going to give you individual stock names on here. I mentioned that. You know, I got the problem with FINRA. Uh, but look, you know, just in, you know, invest in some of our funds, your Pacific funds. We've got commodity stocks in there. We've got exposure to agriculture, to energy, raw materials. It's in our funds. Um, besides the gold fund, what are the other your Pacific funds that you are most excited at? The emerging market fund has been a laggard recently. The emerging market fund and the gold fund, I think, are going to be the biggest winners appreciation-wise. Of course, they come with the highest risk, right? There's, there's no... Uh, 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 reward without risk, right? No pain, no gain. So if you want the funds that go up the most, then those are the funds you should look at. But if, you're, if you want to be more of a preservation kind of guy, you don't need the home run. You just don't want to strike out. You want to make sure you get on base, right? Win the game. Uh, then you buy the dividend payers fund. You buy the value fund. Those are going to be, I believe, very solid performers. In fact, if you look at these funds, over the last one three and five years, they're five-star funds. Now, three years ago, they were all one-star funds. I was so underperforming, and I went from one-stars to five-stars in these funds because my strategy is slowly coming into vogue, which is value over growth, right? Dividends over speculation. This is just the beginning. I'm confident, and again, this is my opinion. I could be wrong, right? I'm, you know, I'm confident that you know, five years from now, I'm going to be crushing it. I'll be, I think I'll be number one, five stars, these funds over 10 years, we will be killing our competitors and we'll be killing the U.S. market by a wide margin. That is my belief. You know, slow and steady wins the race. Yes, the U.S. market got out to a big head start. Okay, fine. They're going to blow it, right? The, like the, the tortoise uh, and the hare, right? I, I'm that slow and steady. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to win this race. And I think anybody who is following my investment advice is going to win this race. Could I be wrong? Sure, right? It, it, you got to decide what you believe, right? I think that enough of my predictions have come true. In fact, if you actually know my predictions over the years and follow me, oh, so much has happened. Stuff that nobody thought could happen has happened, and I called it going back more than a decade. All that hasn't happened is we haven't had the dollar crash yet. Hasn't, you know, we haven't had the explosive move up in gold. Well, by the time that happens, it's too late to follow my investment advice. You've blown it. You've got to make a decision that based on what I've said and what's already happened, that it's more likely than not that I am right. And that following my investment advice is better 
than following the investment advice of so many people who have gotten everything wrong. It's just that they've made money despite themselves because of the bubble, right? And I remember, I was criticizing like Kathy Wood, this fund is down, uh, what, 70 something percent from the peak. People were singing her praises, you know, when her fund was way up there. We have, we barely started to go down. It's a long way down for that fund. And yeah, you know, if you got in it for a while, you were beating me. You were beating me by a uh, by mile, but you stay in that fund. I mean, I'm going to crush it, I think, because that fund is going to keep on falling. Obviously, I'm already beating it for the last few years, but if you go back to inception, right, it's still got some good gains if you were one of the few that got in at the very beginning. Uh, but most people that got in are way down. That's what happens. People buying at the top, right? That's the problem. When everything is expensive, people want to buy, and then they, they buy it at the top, and the bottom drops out. Raymond, can you give specific indicators to look for that may show that the central bank is losing control? They're already there. The bond market. Look what happened in the UK. The UK bank already lost control. They already had a pivot. I can already tell the Fed is losing control. You're already seeing FOMC members breaking ranks and starting to talk. Maybe we're too, we did too much. Maybe we raised too much. Maybe we went too quick. It's happening. The signs are there. Right? That we're, that we're starting to see the metals already move. Um, so it's there. It's happening. You don't, have to, you don't have to look for the signs. The signs have, have already found you. Anyway, it's after 8.30. I thank everybody. The people, I didn't get to your question. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. I'll get your questions next time. And I'm running out of, uh, of uh, voice, too, as a matter of fact. Oh, and I got another interview coming up. I forgot about that. I got the CNBC Asia. Let me look at my at my um, my calendar for what time I'm doing that. That's at 9:30. So I got an hour to rest, rest, and I got to come back and do that interview. But anyway, thanks. I still got one more podcast coming up this week. It won't be another live one, but I'm going to do another podcast uh, by the end of the week. You know, we've got uh, the Jewish holiday. Uh, Rush, uh, Yom Kippur is coming up tomorrow. So obviously, I'm not going to do a podcast tomorrow. Starts on uh, tomorrow night, and then it goes through into Wednesday. It ends Wednesday night. So I probably won't do one until Friday, maybe Saturday, something like that. Happy New Year, by the way, to all of uh, my uh, uh, Jewish uh, uh, listeners to, uh, to this podcast. But again, you want to listen to that podcast the day I record it, sign up for Locals. Uh, the, the links to do that are on uh, the website, you, go, you know, shiftradio.com. Uh, and, uh, and sign up for, for Locals. But we will do uh, more of these and more of them on Locals in the near future, especially when we get big moves in the market, like the one we got today. In fact, we're going to get even bigger moves uh, in the markets in the days ahead. Uh, bye for now.